Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. Maxwell looks up. She sees it's on from Law. Spread along. Hands into the corner. Chloe Rowley is going to get there. Needs to get close to the posts. Scotland have given themselves a kick for a chance at the World Cup. Scotland have wow. to get this kick, Phil. Wow. Given the points difference between the two, if it is a draw, it will come down to points difference, and Ireland have that already wrapped up before kickoff. This for another chance to go to the Rugby World Cup next year. Scotland have done it. <laughs> they have downed Ireland. Yeah, that was the moment that Ireland missed out on a place at next year's Women's Rugby World Cup in New Zealand. It was all going OK until 50 seconds to go when Ireland found themselves in a the defensive position inside their own 22. It was worked out wide. Scotland were able to get around to the post to make the uh, kick a little bit more attainable. Went between the posts. Scotland winning by 20 points to 18. A draw or a win would have sent Ireland to the Repugé where they would have played against uh, some of the Asian teams who have not already qualified for the World Cup in New Zealand. If they got a bonus point victory, they would have went directly to next year's World Cup. That place going to Italy and Scotland will go to the next qualifier tournament where they are expected to book their place at the World Cup. It's a huge disappointment for Ireland, who you will remember back in 2014 beat New Zealand at the World Cup and qualified for the semi-finals of the tournament. A member of that team was Fiona Hayes, who I'm delighted is with me now uh, to break down what went wrong at this European qualifying tournament. Uh, Fiona, how are you getting on this afternoon? I'm good, Will. Thanks for having me on. I think my heart broke a little bit there again listening to that over. It's been a, it's been a tough uh, few hours. It's almost like a dream for me. I, I really, really thought we were going to qualify for this World Cup. It's a horrible way to lose a game, but in many ways, the first game against Spain probably came back to haunt because the second round results played everyone back in and everyone was level going into the final day. Italy got their bonus point win against Spain, so it meant even a kickoff time at five o'clock in Parma Adam Griggs side knew exactly what they had to do to qualify or to go on to the next stage of qualifying. And like realistically, with the way that they were managing the game, you didn't really see Scotland coming back and getting a late score to take it away at the end. No, and 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 that's the thing. I mean, I thought Ireland's performance at times was was quite good. Obviously, game management came into place in the last maybe 15, 20 minutes where where that just didn't happen for the girls. And and I thought like they came out with great intent. You know, I I, I actually I, I actually felt like it was going to be a good performance. I was looking at the start, the 15 minutes, thinking we could actually get the bonus point win here. But it just seemed to die down. And I suppose Scotland had those two moments right before half time and right after half time. And that's where you get killed if if a team can get you in those two kind of parts of the game, I think you're you're in big trouble then. We can talk about some of the wider issues around women's rugby and why things have not kicked on, particularly since the World Cup in 2017 and the slash in funding. But on a very basic fundamental level, going right back to the Spain game, I remember watching the first half and there were so many dropped passes and dropped opportunities and good scoring areas which weren't converted that came back to haunt when they were beaten 8-7. Improved a bit in the performance last week against Italy and then, as you say, it was a mixed bag against Scotland. But realistically, after a long training camp, after a period in Italy to, accum to acclimatise before playing this tournament, Ireland should have been able to sweep out Spain, Italy and Scotland to go to the finals realistically. Absolutely, Will. And you know what? Um, I've said and I've talked with this with ex-players and, and we're in WhatsApp groups and we're obviously all constantly discussing each game and discussing issues around the game. But for me, I suppose when we look at that Spain game, drop passes, you're 100% right. The girls weren't match ready. They're, they haven't been playing games. They've had numerous camps. And when you play at an international level, it's it's very, very different to the intensity that you would play. Even the first 10 minutes can be quite hectic until you get your second wind. So for me, I don't. They were taken away from their clubs. You know, there was an Interpros here in Ireland and uh, players didn't play in that Interpros. It wasn't like it was just leading up, I suppose, into the qualifiers. But they could have maybe looked at maybe having that a little bit earlier and gotten those girls that game time, I think, was what they, which is what they would have needed. And we saw that in the first game against Spain. The errors were absolutely crazy from a team that I know have absolute skill and would have worked very, very hard in their skills throughout the year. Because I know some players who were very frustrated who were on the fringes of the team who were in camp 
but hadn't played competitively for quite some time. Maybe were substitutes or were injured during the Six Nations not getting a look in. But yet they've been at two lengthy camps before going to Italy. Realistically, when there was a small core group of players that were used throughout this tournament, they feel that if they'd been released back out to their provinces to play in the Interpros, at least they could have been a bit match sharper coming around to this tournament. Yeah, th- that's it. Like, I mean, like to be fair, they I think they released some of the girls from the wider section of squad to Munster and Leinster. I know they and maybe kind of got a couple of players, but but it's it's looking at that. I mean, how there there was no AL. Obviously, the Premiership went on in England, and some of the girls had played matches over there. But but there there was no AIL, you know, because of COVID. But even before that. Like I've coached an AIL team and the girls weren't released a lot of the time to play in those games. So you're talking maybe some girls that might have been 18 months with them out without them actually playing a game of 15s rugby, which is absolutely crazy to think. And I know Spain and Italy would have, would have had the same kind of issues as well, maybe around their, their club and looking at that. But for some reason, it didn't work for us because we went in there and as much as they talked about how great they trained, and I'm sure the camps were intense, and I'm sure they trained at a very high level, it just match awareness game awareness was absolutely lacking I thought yeah I was trying to Stacey Flood last week and I asked was there a bit of ring rustiness in the first two games and maybe that led to some of the mistakes she put a brave face on it and understandably that's what a player is going to say back out is look our camps have been so intense some of the best Mm. games we've had are A against B and because of the good training that we're doing but then I'd have to look at it Fiona and think look at the line out which is misfired throughout these three games I Mm. can't understand why the line out was so poor and also a decision being made along the way to jettison McDermott and to put Sam Monaghan into the team mid-tournament when McDermott was previously the line-out caller. Like, when your set-piece is such a key part of the game, I can't understand how that would misfire after so much time in camp. Yeah, now, as far as I'm aware, I think, um, like, maybe a couple of months back, they did change the caller and Nicola Friday became the, the main caller. So you're taking out Aoife's height 100%. I mean, that's who their go-to person a lot of the time was. And you could see, like, you can't blame the hooker a lot of the time. There was just, there was missed jumps, there was missed lifts, and it was... It was unusual because I have talked to girls up at camp and that line seemed to be really, really firing and everything was going well. But it's it's that same thing that we talked about earlier. When you don't have opposition, I mean, you're probably throwing up a pod in, in an Ireland team because they know your calls. So they're, you're obviously not going to, you know, go off the calls they're calling. But the Spanish, Italian, Scottish, they were able to get up in front of a lot of times and really, especially the Scottish, really, really disrupt our line out. And it absolutely... Um, was our downfall at times in that Scottish game. Would the solution have been to try and look for fixtures? Because, look, I accept that there's maybe not the depth of teams that you could play against, and it was particularly awkward because these are European qualifiers, so the teams you would have probably looked to try and get games against are the ones who were actually playing in it. And then England and France are a step above because they're now professional rugby teams. There's probably a shortage of teams you could have played against, but should Ireland have actually sought out some opposition to at least get some games into legs during the summer and heading into this? Yeah, and I think so. And I mean, and like they've like there's seven girls that were that were put in there, and they, geez, they performed really well at times. But there's a lot of seven girls that were in there that wouldn't have played 15 rugby maybe in years and years since they were younger. So like if you're doing that and you make that decision, I think it's very very important to get that cohesion in the team. So you need to get these girls fixtures. They need to be playing 15s rugby. It's a completely different game, and no matter how skillful they are in the tackle area with their hands, whatever. When it comes to 15s rugby, it's absolutely 100% a different game. And I think, as I said earlier, I think a solution to that would be maybe bringing the Interpros a little bit earlier, firing them all out to the provinces and, and letting them get that three games under their belt. And if injuries happen, they happen, but you have a backup system and you have players there ready to go waiting in the wings, and well, which they do. Well, I was reading Philip Doyle's tweets earlier and he was uh, pointing fingers at Anthony Eddy around all this and where the balance has been over the last five or six years between resources and time being pumped into the sevens program versus the 15s and some of those sevens players have found themselves into the 15 system and look in some cases it's worked out really well but yeah. i worry when i hear things like you know stacy floods talking about how she's uh, learning the position at out half on the fly through matches that they're playing during the six nations uh, amy lee murphy crow who's never played in defensive systems in the 15s outside of a few club games coming in from sevens you know lucy Mulhall being straight in to play at outside center in a qualifier game it's very difficult to change your instincts from sevens to play in a 15 system when you're having to do so in matches that matter 
Absolutely. And and like I've had this discussion with Alison Miller in the past about Amy Lee Murphy, because to me, she is absolute speed merchant. She's unbelievable. So like I'm not a winger. I was an old slow prop. So I, I wouldn't know what they, they'd be doing out there with their and the wing, you know, when they eventually get the ball. But Ali said like it takes it's actually it's not just a quick shift. So it's not just her speed. It's her footwork, her positioning and everything. And it is going to take her a couple of games to settle. And she did settle, but she got those games on. Under her belt before she went into this qualifier so I think it was very very unfair to throw a couple of girls in there that maybe haven't been involved in these systems and especially at centre as well I mean it's such a pivotal part of of the game plan and you know like obviously Sene really experienced was there with her but but you know it didn't work and I suppose Lucy then was taken out and that that hits the players confidence as well you need to be able to build up and and when I played you know under Goose as you talked earlier under Philip Doyle you had to be out playing your club rugby you had to be there if you weren't he didn't want to know he wanted to see the physicality he wanted to see you playing every single weekend and he'd make his decision sometimes off that and obviously what you bring to camp but some Sometimes I'm feeling at, the, at this moment in time, players are going straight into camp. I know we're trying to get to a more professional setup, but that to me shouldn't mean less games. You know, you've got to, you still got to do the, the groundwork in the AIL, in the interprovincial system and break your way into an international team. And surely it has to be a frustration if you're a player who's played well for your club and in the Interpros over the last three or four years, you've been in on the Ireland camp and next thing a sevens player gets jettisoned in and they're straight into the starting 15. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, like, and I've I've talked to some of the girls about it, and obviously, like, you can't say anything publicly. You're mm. you're on a squad, and and those girls are probably the nicest people. You know, it's not their fault either. They're they're asked, they're delighted to represent your country at, at 15s rugby. Absolutely delighted. Why not go in there and take the chance? But it can be frustrating for players that are are playing week in week out as a set of club. They're 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 building their name. Like you look at Chloe Pierce, she had an absolutely amazing interpros. You know, and she's worked. I, I've worked with her in Bowes. She's worked her way up the whole time at club level. And, you know, she's just outside the system. Or she didn't make it into that squad, but she's put in the time and she'll hopefully get there in the future. And she, even though maybe wasn't in the proposition, she'd look on and she'd see some players come in out of nowhere. And I suppose that's as a, as a player and other players, you're, you're just questioning in the back of your mind, what do you need to do to, to get in there? Like, is this like you know and, and that's what niggles away at players and I think that can that can stay in your head when you're playing games if I'm honest Look I'm not a training so I can't see how Claire Malloy is training along the way but how is Claire Malloy not starting like I couldn't understand that after the Italy game she comes in and puts in a Trojan performance particularly on the defensive side of the game I thought she was nailed on to start I couldn't believe on Friday when the team was announced and it was an unchanged starting 15 and that Claire Malloy wouldn't be in to start Absolutely. I, I'm not up at camp either, so I can't comment on that. But what I can comment on is what Claire Malloy has brought to every single camp I've ever been at in my life. And that is absolute professionalism, aggression. She's like a terrier. She brings the game up. She brings everyone around them up. And what she has now is because she's played a very long time. Is she's a great knowledge of the game, and she knows to be in the right places at the right time. And what what um, breakdowns to hit, what steals are on. You know, she fans out all that all that business. So I hundred percent couldn't understand that. But that's that's a coaching. That's obviously a coaching decision. There could be other stuff going on in the background. I I don't know that. But for me, even when she came on, the impact. You know, she could come on with a chip in her shoulder and be kind of annoyed because she has she's a lot of caps under her belt but she came on in both games and absolutely trained or sorry worked her butt off as they say on the pitch and she too amazing she did a steal in the last 15 minutes and what would have been probably the turnover of the game bar what you know the yellow card incident like she just literally got in there and got an absolute steal right when Ireland needed it like the back row is the engine room of a team and I would Absolutely. have thought if you've got Claire Malloy there alongside Kira Griffin loads of experience of both players Dorothy yeah. Wall who's been a bit of a revelation too that's a well balanced back row and that would have been well set up to dominate the game yeah and you know like and like uh, Adele McMahon is 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 a, is a great player as well and she can play six and you can vary that up you can but for me having Kira and Claire Malloy there 